Most great musicians have that one album that was so excellent or successful that all of their impressive albums released afterwards get compared to it. For David Bowie, this album was Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. Released on September 12, 1980, exactly 40 years ago, the album was the transitive state between the thoughtful, experimental, and outrageous material Bowie had produced over the last decade and the more commercially successful pop music he would produce over the next. While not ostensibly a concept album like the only album I've covered up to this point, Scary Monsters gives off a harsh, desperate, and claustrophobic atmosphere of self-reflection, and is one of Bowie's most disturbed and apocalyptic since Aladdin Sane and Diamond Dogs, to such a point that I have to provide a general content warning right now, warning that this video will go to some very dark places, as well as more specific content warnings for each song. If you have not yet listened to Scary Monsters, I'd highly advise you to do so, not just so that you can experience it on your own before I start explaining it, but also because it's just that good. With all that being said, I think it's finally time to start analyzing. No. The first song on the album is part one of the album's bookending song titled It's No Game. The track starts with the sound of the album's co-producer, Tony Visconti, rewinding and pressing play on his Lyric 24-track tape deck, the setup for a motif that will pay off at the song's startling conclusion, as well as in the ending to the album as a whole, before Robert Fripp's lead guitar and Michi Hirota's vocals violently thrust us into the song's narrative of a man sitting in front of a television and flicking through the channels, outraged and repulsed by what he sees, the natural evolution of this scene in 1976's The Man Who Fell to Earth. What exactly he sees is described by the rapid-fire vignettes present in the song's lyrics, which describe visions of a shadowy Orwellian state monitoring a possible uprising, The final line there being a dark allusion to Eddie Cochran's Three Steps to Heaven and the simple idealism it and the time it was made in represent, as the album's first moment of killing off the past, and of the Documentaries on refugees, couples against the target, described in the song's bridge. The song's juxtaposition of these rapid-fire, disparate images creates a quite jarring, polarizing, and chaotic environment. The narrator's confused attempts at processing this chaotic collage of cable news are also present, first in the song's chorus and its repeated acknowledgement of the seriousness of the situation, no next in his confession that the bite-sized stories the television presents prevent him from fully understanding the situation, and ultimately in the third and final verse, in which his confused search for some semblance of meaning in this chaotic and disparate set of events turns to anger and disgust. So is Bowie's musings in the latter part of the song's bridge are repurposed from an unreleased song written when Bowie was 16 and recorded in 1970 titled Tired of My Life. 
Log a rock upon a road and it breaks into pieces. Shake a branch upon the snow and the sun is defeated. Pull the curtains on yesterday and it seems so much later. Put a bullet in my brain and I make all the paper. The line about drawing the blinds on yesterday is possibly a reference to the album's practice of looking back at, and quite often killing off, the past, present in the very reuse of the lyric itself, and the line about putting a bullet in his brain and it making all the papers is a comment about how modern news media capitalizes on people's misfortunes, helping to create this chaotic and depressing landscape of television news the song's narrator finds himself in. As David Buckley points out in Strange Fascination, the line would receive new resonance when, three months after the album was released on December 8th, John Lennon was shot and killed outside of his New York apartment. Lennon's murder terrified Bowie, not just because his friend and idol, who coincidentally had been a large influence on the song, according to Bowie on the interview promo disc released alongside the album. And now the, the, the opening version, it's almost not, uh, inarticulate at times, the, the vocals on it, and it owes an awful lot to John Lennon. Um, but there again, he was always had that same intensity that I've, I hope that I capture on some of my things when, it, when I try that kind of move. Had been killed, but also because he had been performing in The Elephant Man, which Lennon's killer had been to see days before killing Lennon, roughly 20 blocks away from Lennon's apartment when it had happened. And it's rumored that Bowie was on his list of visible celebrities to gun down had Lennon been unavailable. Bowie reportedly stayed up until dawn watching the television coverage of Lennon's murder. Bowie's vocals on the song are that of anguished screaming, having been described as, quote, a long distorted yowl of pain, end quote, and, quote, as if he's literally tearing out his intestines, end quote, communicating the narrator's anger and disgust with society and adding to the chaotic atmosphere of the song. <laughs> Accompanying Bowie's vocals are the spoken word vocals of Misi Hirota, who reads out a literal translation of what Bowie is singing in Japanese. Of this creative decision, Bowie said, I wanted to break down a particular kind of sexist attitude about women, and, and I thought that the Japanese girl typifies it, where everybody sort of um, pictures them as the, the geisha girl and very sort of sweet and demure and non-thinking when in fact that is the absolute opposite of what women are like. They think an awful lot <laughs> with quite as much strength as uh, any man. Um, so I, I wanted to sort of caricature that kind of attitude by having a very forceful Japanese voice on it. So I had a girlfriend of mine come out with a very sort of samurai kind of feeling. Not only do Hirota's vocals further add to the song's dissonant and chaotic atmosphere, especially if you speak Japanese considering that, as Chris O'Leary points out in his blog post about the song, Hirota's delivery and use of pronouns is explicitly masculine, using ore, the first-person pronoun only an older Japanese man would use. It also demonstrates that these feelings of anger and social anxiety transcend gender and nationality. Both Bowie's and Hirota's vocals are backed by the searing lead guitar riffs of Robert Fripp, further adding to the track's violent chaos, and reminiscent of his intense guitar work more than a decade earlier on King Crimson's 21st Century Schizoid Man, another song to use a rapid series of disconnected images delivered with harsh, distorted vocals to communicate a sense of anger about the chaos of current events. <laughs> As the song starts to putter out near its end, Bowie's distorted screeches of shut up snap it to a halt, and you remember that it was a tape loop all along. It's a jolting and quite disturbing moment, pointing out that just as the song's narrator is experiencing this chaotic disarray of news stories through a television set, you are experiencing his story through a pair of headphones in a music player, a music player about to start playing the next song. The 
The next song on the album is titled Up the Hill Backwards, and upon first listening to it, it seems like the polar opposite of the previous track. While It's No Game Part 1 was enraged about the injustices in the world and had a jarring and chaotic environment, Up the Hill Backwards acknowledges these injustices but is detached and disinterested in them, and has an apathetic and repetitive environment. The epitome of indifference. This suspicion would be further backed up by the song's lyrics, which borrow the previous song's technique of a quick list of disparate images, but the images in Up the Hill Backwards are much vaguer. They start off with a glimmer of hope, pondering the fresh start provided by the advent of freedom. Only to fall into the same grim visions of fatal events. A series of shocks, stickers fall apart. A mysterious other performing work we can't observe. And the bleak yet ambiguous contents of the line following it. The most specific image we are given is that of the UK cover art for the single, which features a man wearing a face mask, an image that has, to say the least, become more relevant in light of recent events. The picture is rendered in dark, warm hues, capturing the bleakness of the unspecified situations depicting that seem to blend together, drawing our attention to the white face mask in the center of the picture, a viscerally upsetting image in which the face mask seems to be melting on the person's face, perhaps taking a cue from Dali. To find an image more specific than that, one would have to dig up the song's demo version, in which the line in the second verse about witnesses falling is replaced by Skylabs are falling a reference to the 1979 crash of NASA's Skylab space station. As O'Leary points out, this event was, quote, an all-purpose symbol of American decline, end quote, and its use in the demo version of the song seems to be expressing the death of the space-age dream that is later explored in Ashes to Ashes. It's got nothing to do with you if one can grasp it. It's got nothing to do These disparate images are accompanied by the fatalistic chantings of the song's chorus, which encourages detaching oneself from these events and, as O'Leary put it, quote, stumbling blindly towards a future that we can't or won't imagine, our eyes trained on the ground that we've already crossed, end quote. This fatalism shows up again in the song's bridge. The first line of which is a quote from the preface to Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols, at least according to this genius lyrics annotation. I'm not committed enough to this to read a philosophy book from over a century ago for it. And could be indicating the album's musings on fame and Bowie's characters in later songs. And the second line is a reference to Thomas A. Harris's best-selling 1967 self-help book, I'm Okay, You're Okay. The mutilation of its title applying the same indifference to fixing the problems with society to fixing the problems with oneself. This indifference is made much more apparent by both the song's cyclical chord structure, as O'Leary points out, and the song's vocals, in which Bowie's voice is just one in a very M.O.R. voiced chorus of voices that Deborah Ray Cohen compared to the blank contentment of the addicts in Huxley's Brave New World. All of this indifference reaches its breaking point, now so absurd that you're forced to realize that the song isn't endorsing this cold, detached worldview at all. It's actually critiquing it. So it really sort of sounds like the epitome of indifference, but in fact, the I blocked it uh, from beginning to end with the, the extraordinary high-energy frip quasi bow diddly thing that happens in the beginning and the end, which sort of bookend it and give it another kind of uh, a switch. It has far more power than it would f at first seem as a, a, a commitment. In fact, it has a very strong commitment, but it, it's disguised in indifference. While the lyrics, vocals, and most of the instrumentation on Up the Hill Backwards make it seem like the indifferent polar opposite to the first part of It's No Game, Fripp's powerful and aggressive guitar solos reveal that the anger and commitment of the first song haven't been totally lost yet. Fripp's closing solo fades out, and the next song begins. Scary monsters, sober creeps. Keep me 
The third song is the album's title track, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, and is narrated by an obsessive criminal with a, a conscience who talks about how he corrupted a fine young mind. In the first verse, he describes the woman and his obsession with her, characterizing it as a one-way door. She had an aura of room, she was dying. And in the second verse, he describes how he played into her wants, wreaking havoc on her fragile psyche. She asked me to stay and I stole her room. She asked for my love and I gave her a dangerous smile. And the tragic toll it took on her. Now she's stupid in the street and she can't socialize. with the last line there serving as an acknowledgement of his never-ending obsession with her. As O'Leary said, quote, Whatever depths she plummets, he'll fall with her, hand in hand, end quote. Perhaps the song's most tragic image is that described in the chorus and pre-chorus, in which the narrator describes the girl's tormented screams about being chased by demons, so damaged by the song's narrator that she can no longer trust anyone. She began to whine out, tell us his scream. Bowie sings the vocals with an exaggerated Mockney accent, a, as Cohen put it, quote, garish caricature of maudlin sentiment, end quote, that paints the track as a nasty piece of Londonism. As O'Leary points out, this decision adds to the song's, quote, lurid horror movie feel, end quote, taking the dilapidated Burroughs-esque urban landscape of Diamond Dogs' Hunger City and giving it a gritty edge by transporting it into the real world. The song's instrumentation adds to this gritty and chaotic feel, with Bowie's heavily distorted vocals that sound like he's singing through the rotating blades of a fan, being accompanied by Fripp's screaming guitar, the guttural-sounding bass riff at the song's beginning, and the repetitive, mechanical clanging of a cowbell run through a guitar distortion pedal. All of this makes the song as chaotic and conflicting as It's No Game, Part 1, with the effect of not just a gritty and dark sense of realism, but also of giving the sense of the narrator's conflicting thoughts as he goes through having his own self-doubts, I think. Fripp's closing guitar solo exemplifies this, with O'Leary observing that, quote, the solo comes when expected, a burst of energy after the second chorus, but it doesn't provide release as much as it drags you further into the mire, end quote, mirroring how the narrator's never-ending obsession with the girl drags him to whatever depths she plummets. This dark, frenetic atmosphere of self-doubt and paranoia continues throughout the album, so it's no wonder that this is the track the album derives its title from. The chaotic combination of manic instrumentals and Bowie's distorted backing vocals slowly fades out before the next song begins. Ashes to ash and fun to fuck it. We know major tongues are drunk in, strung out in heaven's high. The next song on the album is Ashes to Ashes, a sequel to 1969's Space Oddity, best described as a science fiction treatment of Thomas De Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater, with Major Tom in the role of a cosmic junkie. The song starts by breaking the fourth wall, directly addressing the listener and referencing Bowie's Space Oddity. Do you remember It's true. In the second half of the first verse, we hear the contents of Major Tom's message back to Earth, which starts out content and peaceful. They got a message from the action man. Away. 
before quickly falling into De Quincey and nightmare visions, descriptions of the sorry state his addiction has left him in, and his longing for his addiction to stop, all accompanied by indecipherable murmuring. The shaking of nothing is giving just bits as a chap goes in synthesis And I ain't got no money and I ain't got no hands So to lose the end of my love But I'm hoping to kick but the planet is glowing a dualism of pretending you're okay while you're actually going through a living hell with smatterings of the publicity image of the astronaut at work as an automaton that Space Oddity countered, and of the experience of suffering from a stigmatized health problem like addiction. These descriptions of the pains of addiction continue in the song's second verse, which starts with Major Tom's fantasy of staying clean that ends with more hallucinations, seeming to represent withdrawal. Time again, I tell myself, I'll stay clean. Continues with Major Tom likening his condition to being stuck with a valuable friend, the word stuck here possibly serving as a double entendre for being stuck with a needle, sarcastically referring back to his message in the first verse, and describing another mysterious hallucination, possibly about death. I'm stuck with a valuable friend. as well as a self-deprecating confession of emotional paralysis, which Bowie said in an interview with NME, quote, represents a continuing returning feeling of inadequacy over what I've done, end quote. I've never done good things. I've never done bad things. I've never did anything out of the blue. Whoa. And ends with Major Tom admitting that he wants to break the ice and come down from his addiction. A reference to a letter by Franz Kafka in which he wrote, quote, A book must be an ice axe to break the frozen seas inside us. End quote. Even scarier still are the points in the song when Major Tom's suffering becomes little more than a warning for children, his painful addiction becoming such common knowledge that it's the subject of the nonsense playground rhyme in the song's chorus. Ashes to ash and fun to fuck it. We know Major Tom's a junkie Strung out in heaven's mind The last line of which references the title of the first album Bowie released after moving to Berlin, and Major Tom becoming so associated with the substance he became addicted to that he becomes synonymous with it, the nursery rhyme in the song's outro warning children of the dangers of messing with Major Tom. As Buckley points out, these lines are a direct echo of the nursery rhyme, quote, My mother said that I never should play with in the wood, end quote. And Bowie himself said that the song is... It's also a nursery rhyme. It's very much a 1980s nursery rhyme. And that is that it... I think 1980s nursery rhymes will have a lot to do with the 1880s, 1890s nursery rhymes, which were all rather horrid and had little boys with their ears being cut off and stuff like that. Well, I think that this is... <laughs> we're, we're getting round to that again. I think the idea of the Sesame Street nice nursery rhyme is possibly outdated, unfortunately. There's no doubt that this vision of Major Tom as a cosmic junkie was influenced by Bowie's experiences with cocaine, which he first started using when he was recording Diamond Dogs in 1973, and was addicted just six months later, subsisting on a diet of peppers, milk, and cocaine, and reaching his peak of frenzied paranoia around the time he was recording Station to Station in 1975. However, simply saying that Ashes to Ashes is about Bowie's cocaine addiction is only looking at a small part of the story. Major Tom's death in the song is not just symbolic of the death of the pre-drugs wild-eyed boy from Free Cloud Bowie was when he made Space Oddity, it's also symbolic of the death of Bowie's characters as a whole, with the exception of Nathan Adler, and the death of the Space Age dream that era represented. I was thinking of how I was going to place uh, Major Tom in, in this, hence, ten years later on, what would be the complete disillusion with the with the 
great dream that was being propounded when they shot him into space ten years ago and had got such wonderful ideas. Um, this great technology was capable of putting him up, up there. When he did get up there, he wasn't quite sure why he'd been put there. And we left him there, but now we come to him ten years later and we find that the whole thing has soured because there was no reason for putting him up there. It was an ego, a, a technological ego, which got him up there for no specific reason and just added more disaster because it was a, 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 a potpourri of, of, of technical ideas. And so the most disastrous thing I, I could think of is that he finds solace only in some kind of heroin-type drug uh, actually being that the, the cosmic space itself was feeding him with an addiction and he wanted he wants now to return to the womb from whence he came it's also possible that ashes to ashes is using the international celebrity and isolation of the astronaut as a symbol of fame something present but only implied in space oddity and made more overt in songs like elton john's rocket man the horrors of Major Tom's cosmic addiction and Bowie's killing off the 70s are made even more apparent through the song's patchwork quilt of instrumentals, which O'Leary described as, quote, stitched together out of discarded rhythm tracks and random overdubs, end quote. O'Leary also points out that the song's vocal line is a, quote, reverse image of life on Mars, whose legendary octave leaps in its chorus are countered by, in ashes, verses filled with octave drops, end quote a fitting inversion pointing out the contrast between life on Mars, in which our protagonist is a mousy-haired girl who sees space as an escape from the mundaneness of life, and ashes to ashes, in which our protagonist is an astronaut trapped in a cosmic horror version of space who wants to return to the womb of Earth, yet another moment in the song of Bowie killing off the 70s. Like Tom Ewing wrote in his review of the song, quote, Major Tom thought he was starring in an Arthur C. Clarke story and found himself in a Philip K. Dick one by mistake, and the result is oddly magnificent, end quote. Major Tom's nightmarish visions and this killing off of the past are perfectly communicated in the song's iconic music video directed by Bowie and David Mallet. Parts of the video were shot at Pet Level Beach, with the cliffs towering over the beach, and it's this dreamlike landscape alongside the video's cinematography, which utilizes horror movie-style camera angles, solarized color, erratic cuts between scenes in hypersaturated color and black and white, and the video's eclectic collection of bizarre imagery that give the video a queasy, fever dream quality communicating Major Tom's mental state. Included in the video's bizarre collection of imagery is the fourth wall breaking video within video motif used to introduce each new sequence of the video. This shot of Bowie trapped in a Gigeresque chamber with tubes pumping things in and out of him. This image of Bowie half submerged in the sea that Buckley says is, quote, as if he's drowning in his own subconsciousness, end quote, pointing out the similarities between it and a similar shot in the music video for Peter Gabriel's Shock the Monkey, the part when Bowie winces in pain after a photographer snaps his photograph, the scene in which Bowie is sitting in a dentist chair in a 1950s kitchen while things explode around him, a concept taken from the performance of Space Oddity Bowie did for a Kenny Everett special on New Year's Eve 1979, perhaps meant to be a distorted memory of Major Tom's time on Earth, the shots in which Bowie plays the role of an asylum inmate trapped in a padded cell, another visual taken from the Kenny Everett special, this time reminiscent of Bowie's All the Mad Men, the scene in which Bowie, under a pitch black sky, walks along the beach, being lectured by an elderly woman while the song's outro plays, and Major Tom's funeral march consisting of two space nuns, a ballerina, and a gothic bride that add to the grim Victorian nursery rhyme feel of the song, and are vaguely evocative of De Quincey's notion of worshipping at the Church of Opium, occasionally bowing and consecrating the ground while accompanied by a bulldozer serving as a mechanical symbol of oncoming violence and burial. The video's most iconic image is that of Bowie dressed as the stock pantomime character of Pierrot, a Bowie deep cut referencing his days with Lindsay Kemp in Pierrot and Turquoise or The Looking Glass Murders, the George Underwood painting on the back of the sleeve of his eponymous 1969 album, the brightly colored landscapes of which, as well as the pairing of Pierrot with an elderly woman, also make a comeback in the music video, and Bowie's technique of creating characters to accompany his music, saying in a 1971 interview with Rolling Stone, quote, the music is the mask the message wears, music is the Pierrot, and I, the performer, am the message, end quote.
This Pierrot motif is the album's most prominent piece of iconography, appearing on most of the album's singles and on the album's striking cover art, in which the Edward Bell painting of Bowie as Pierrot in the left half of the frame looks on with solemn dignity, haunted by Brian Duffy's monochrome photograph of Bowie as Pierrot and the menacingly large and ghostly shadow in the right half of the frame, with a sharp divide between the two halves, not dissimilar to the famous lightning bolt on the cover of Bowie's Aladdin Saint beautifully capturing the polarized, dissonant atmosphere of tracks like It's No Game, Part 1, the fear and paranoia of tracks like Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, the duality of Major Tom's message to Earth in the first verse of Ashes to Ashes, the Pierrot motif used in the song's video, and the can of worms contained inside the, the, the beautiful everyman, the, uh, the, the falling apart of what seems like purity. A torn photograph of Pierrot also appears on the back of the album's sleeve, alongside the shrunken and distorted cutouts of Bowie's previous albums, Low, Heroes, Lodger, and The Inner Gatefold of Aladdin Sane, in the album's most obvious instance of killing off the past. Unlike my tangents about cover art, Ashes to Ashes ends. The video's ending scene of a somber Major Tom trapped among Gigerian piping dips to white, and the song's grim Victorian nursery rhyme of an outro fades out, leading us into the next song. <laughs> The next song on the album is Fashion, a sort of follow-up to the Kinks' dedicated follower of fashion, in which Bowie mocks the realm of transitory fashion, especially that of the New Romantic movement. The song starts with the sound of a click track on Andy Clark's synthesizer, before it's overtaken by Fripp's snarling guitar riff, which, in turn, gives way to the New York dance groove part of the song, capturing the disorienting, rapidly shifting nature of fashion. This derision of fashion trends continues in the song's lyrics, with the first verse describing a new dance craze originating from People from Bad Homes, a line nicked from the title of an astronaut song, that started full of tension and fear, but has become just another bland unit of conformity. The second verse describing a bland, tasteless, and repetitive craze people from good homes perform on the dance floor. So The meaningless and repetitive vocalizations in the song's outro The rapid and conflicting directions in the song's chorus and pre-chorus, mimicking the disorienting changes that come with being a dedicated follower of the rapidly shifting demands of fashion. fashion. Demands that shift so often that they're different the next time you hear the pre-chorus. And obeying them just makes you another member of the conformist Goon Squad. We are the Goon Squad and we're coming to town. Beep, beep. The song's iconic beep, beep. was first used by Bowie in the unreleased 1971 track Rupert the Riley, Bowie wrote about his car. Beep, beep. 
and its use in fashion paints the conformity in following the fashion as robotic and mechanical, and its followers as the cars being driven by an insidious, grim determination to be fashionable, to as though it's actually a vocation. I have also seen it alleged that this is a jab at Gary Newman's Cars, which, given his role in the New Romantic movement, makes a certain amount of sense. One popular alternative interpretation of the song is that it's about neo-fascism, interpreting the Goon Squad as a reference to neo-fascist groups, and pointing out the us-versus-them mentality of lines like... They do it over there, but we don't do it here. The double meaning of... Fashion, turn to left. Fashion, turn to left. The way Bowie sings... Fashion. As a near homophone of fascism and even the goose-stepping vocal pattern of <laughs> Bowie himself denied this interpretation, saying that the song is It's about that grim determination more than anything else. And while I don't think the validity of an interpretation depends entirely upon authorial intent, although you might not have picked that up considering how often I quote the man, I think the existence of this interpretation just goes to show how grim and authoritarian the song's portrayal of fashion is to the point that multiple authors I've read have referred to it as style fascism. Like Karen L. Cross wrote in her analysis of the album, quote, where once dressing up was liberation and freedom of expression, fashion now arrives with the goon squad in strict formation, end quote. This shallow conformity described in fashion is backed up by the song's more deadpan vocals and by the song's instrumentals, which Cohen points out are, quote, infectious enough to be a dance floor hit, which will merely prove its point, end quote. Like the song before it, Fashion comes with a music video, although unlike Ashes to Ashes, its eclectic collection of bizarre imagery is largely incomprehensible, and nowhere near as striking. Nevertheless, there are a few biting moments in the music video that I feel add to the song's vision of being fashionable as a conformist vocational necessity, such as when Bowie performs the act of consecrating the ground seen in the video for Ashes to Ashes, something once full of tension and fear, as a hollow dance move when they convulse wildly performing a lumbering, zombie-like dance that would later reappear in the video for Black Star, the mini-adverts during the beep-beep parts of the song for all the typical consumables, medicine, malt, and mutt, that Buckley says support the lyrics' condemnation of, quote, consumerism gone ape, end quote, and were likely influenced by Bowie's short time working at an advertising agency, as well as his appreciation for Vance Packard's 1957 book The Hidden Persuaders, and the part in the video in which Bowie plays both icon and fan during the song's chorus, with Bowie the icon sneering and looking down upon Bowie the fan, hypnotized with Bowie the icon, portraying the dark side of the icon-fan relationship and the detachment and inequality in that relationship. This framing also utilized to frame the conflict between the people from bad homes and the people from good homes in the song's lyrics. The song ends, the video dips to white, and the next song begins. <laughs> The next song on the album, and the first song on side B, is Teenage Wildlife, which serves as both an examination of slash warning to the members of the New Romantic movement, most notably Gary Newman, which sprung up in large part because of several clubs in London holding so-called Bowie Nights in the late 70s, and a reflection on his place in the pop industry. Addressed to a mythical teenage brother, if I had one, or maybe it's addressed to my latter-day adolescent self, I'm not sure trying to correct all those things that one thinks one's done wrong or, you know. Um, I'm trying to approach a young mind that is not forearmed to the hypocrisies that he will encounter and the, the stubbornness to change that people have and to accept change and to flow with it rather than become reactionary and fight against it, which produces the terrible conflicts that we find around us. The first verse of the song introduces its protagonist, an optimistic and adventurous teenager who doesn't look too far ahead. Oh, how come you
and naively hopes for success. Blue skies above, sun all your arms, strength in your stride, in the cold, in the squeaking in Dismissed by the crowds, but so devoted to his thirst for success that there's no turning back. You'll get chilly receptions everywhere you go. In the second verse, our protagonist searches for the seeker that will make him successful, only to find that it's all been done before. Yet he still keeps pressing. Break open your melon dollar weapon and put your gun. Stir your push, fill your push, your luck. The verse's final line. Broken nose, no good, you. One of the new heroes. Is commonly interpreted as a dig at Gary Newman, even by Newman himself. But it could just as easily be referring to the song's amalgam of a protagonist, serving as a general symbol of the new wave. This is elaborated on at the beginning of the third verse when Bowie sings, Same old thing in brand new drag, I'm sweeping down oh, 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 oh. In reference to the stage presence and androgyny of new wave acts such as Newman, of whom Bowie said, quote, He's not only copied me, he's clever, and he's got all my influences too, end quote. Culture Club's Boy George, and the Eurythmics' Annie Lennox, which owe a lot to Bowie. Our once optimistic protagonist's desire for success has reduced him to a third-rate clone, just another member of Fashion's Goon Squad who is... In the latter half of the verse, the song takes a bleak turn and ponders whether the success was even worth it in the first place, when its protagonist questions the narrator, who turns out to be Bowie himself, about the mobs gathered for him in the hallway, who responds obliviously, saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. You'll take me your side and say only for the narrator to be isolated, cornered, outnumbered, and apocalyptically finished off with the pained wail of a chorus. before the song's bridge starts with an ominous and gruesome warning of things to come. After which, the song's protagonist suffers a similar fate. Hunted down in the grisly conclusion of Bowie's observation at the beginning that While the blue skies above were once a symbol of the protagonist's optimism and free spirits, they're now the cold and unfeeling canopy overlooking the protagonist's dreadful demise as he's hunted and shot down. Just another one of fashion's styles that is trendy one day and discarded the next. You fall to the Before his admirers gather around his body and whisper that it was probably his time anyway, because he was just another clone. 
Saying that Teenage Wildlife is a jab at Gary Newman and then moving on is missing most of what the song is, a bleak message to his successors warning them to be true to themselves, and not to let their drives for success control their art. As Cohen put it, like Saturn before him, quote, slowly, brutally, and with a savage, satisfying crunch, David Bowie eats his young, end quote, painting a grisly cautionary tale with the remains. Helping to create this cautionary tale is Bowie's vocals that switch from manic and skittish to drawn-out screeches, and Teenage Wildlife's loose, improvisational instrumentals, which O'Leary points out match the harshness of the song's lyrics. Quote, There's a brittle, wavering feel to the track. Nothing is stable. Everything is on the verge of change. End quote. Especially outstanding are the orchestral string chords of Chuck Hammer's guitar synthesizer, Roy Bataan's piano playing accompanying the fourth verse, and Fripp's guitar solos that function as a violent form of release throughout. The song's outro slowly fades out before the next song begins. The next song on the album, originally an astronaut song called I Am a Laser, is titled Scream Like a Baby, and is an Orwellian vision of a future in which the government rounds up gay people and other dissidents, who are then drugged, brainwashed, and occasionally killed, likely inspired by Bowie's fascination with 1984 and other works set in a totalitarian state, such as Arthur Koesler's Darkness at Noon and Eugenie Ginsburg's Journey into the Whirlwind. The song, although taking place in a dystopian future, is narrated in the past tense, a decision Bowie explained by saying, I lapse into this sort of future nostalgia thing often. It <laughs> can be evidenced by looking at any album I've made, and I, that, that particular piece of music is, it, it does reflect that. It's um, writing, uh, taking a past look at something that hasn't actually happened yet, but one kind of sees that Orwellian thing. The song starts with forceful guitar sounds, violently thrusting the listener into its gritty and bleak narrative before the first verse starts, in which the song's narrator tells us his crimes against the state, which include not purchasing merchandise, not joining the military, and mingling with people of other races. his damaged and fragmented mental state. And introduces us to the character of Sam. Well, I The second verse expands on the song's vision of a dystopian future, with the fascist police state cracking down on dissidents. Especially Sam, who is thrown into a wagon with the song's narrator and other political prisoners, who are blindfolded, chained, and drugged in an attempt to assimilate them into society. The song's narrator witnessed Sam's violent attempts at rebellion. But he himself is now brainwashed and complacent. Well, 
and drugged up and sent to a re-education camp, he claims to be learning to integrate into society. But the fact that he can't remember how to pronounce the word demonstrates that the opposite is true, and that the state's violent repression has left him extremely damaged. Now I'm learning to be a part of society. Sam's grim fate is hinted at in the song's chorus, which describes how the totalitarian state impedes any human connection between him and the narrator, the quintessential essence of 1984. and fully revealed in the song's bridge, in which Sam rebels, kicking and screaming to the gruesome, Holocaust imagery-laden end. No athletic program, no discipline, no book, he just sat in the backseat, swearing it's seek revenge, but it jumped into the furthest singing on such the song's grim, cyberpunk look at a future where advanced technology is used by a fascist police state to repress people deemed as undesirable is not just a warning against totalitarianism, it's also a bleak counter to the high-tech utopia promised by New Wave electronic music, with Bowie saying of it, I don't believe in this high-tech society at all. I don't believe it does exist. I think that's a great myth. I think the idea of high-tech songs, high-tech music, computer button, whatever, it's, uh, it's not like that. It's on a very emotional, people level, flesh and blood. It's, it, 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 one foresees it becoming even more terrifyingly real, anti-tech. Um, the, the old symbolic street fighting thing probably will not be as symbolic as it was, but will become a reality. This bleak totalitarian vision of a past that hasn't happened yet is enhanced by Bowie's Verispeed vocals in the song's bridge, with his two vocal tracks gradually separating while one speeds up and the other slows down, reminiscent of the chaotic and conflicting environment of It's No Game, Part 1, with the problems in society right in front of us, no longer separated by a TV screen, and of the can of worms contained inside the, the, the beautiful everyman. The, uh, the, the falling apart of what seems like purity. Of the album's similarly divided cover art, communicating the narrator's incredibly damaged mental state. Helping add to the bleak chaos of the song's lyrics and the dissonance of Bowie's distorted vocals are the song's instrumentals, which O'Leary points out have, quote, one of Bowie's brilliantly chaotic chord progressions, end quote. The song's violent instrumentals screech to a halt, and the song ends before the next song on the album begins. The next song on the album is a cover of Tom Verlaine's Kingdom Come, about the incessant turmoil and strife one experiences in life and the hope for salvation. The song's lyrics represent this strife with a prisoner forced to do manual labor, and in the song's first verse, this prisoner, in the gloomy atmosphere of a rainstorm, experiences visions causing him to question if everything he does is pointless, begging God for an escape from life's turmoil. In the second verse, the narrator's begging for an end to his miserable situation continues with his call for the night, symbolizing an end to work and possibly even death. This time accompanied by the image of a muddy river becoming clear, suggesting purification and salvation, and the narrator's cryptic confession that he knows why he's imprisoned.
The song's bridge, with its descriptions of insurmountable walls blocking escape, and of his captors sure that his only way out is death, communicates the hopelessness and isolation that the narrator feels. and the song's repetitive chorus communicates the protagonist's ceaseless and agonizing labor. In Verlaine's version, this chorus is a call and response, in which each line describing the protagonist's turmoil is followed by an affirming promise of salvation in the second coming of Christ. However, the chorus of Bowie's version is followed not by the hopeful promise of salvation, but by more descriptions of the protagonist's endless turmoil, sung by the fatalistic and indifferent chorus of Up the Hill Backwards. In Bowie's version, this affirming promise of deliverance doesn't come until the song's outro, almost as the song fades out, as if salvation is just an afterthought. Even the outro isn't that hopeful, as that too is destroyed by the differences between Bowie and Verlaine's versions. While Verlaine's vocals are almost relaxed and are sung with what O'Leary describes as Quote, a penitential tone in his singing, the sound of someone consistently being humbled and delighted by the oddness of life, end quote. Bowie's vocals are exaggerated, delivered with raw emotionality, and in what Cohen refers to as a, quote, fake naive drawl, end quote. Bowie's cover of Kingdom Come butchers any faith in salvation present in Verlaine's original, rendering it as bleak and devoid of hope as any other song on the album. The song's outro fades out, and the penultimate song on the album begins. Because you're young. The penultimate song on the album is called Because You're Young, and it's about a relationship between two carefree youths and its inevitable dissolution, narrated by Bowie, who has... I've adopted the, the role of a sort of an old roué in that one, <laughs> looking down on these two young mad things and knowing that it's all going to sort of fizzle out. We're introduced to these two adolescents in the first verse, which uses figurative wording to describe the neurotic young woman and her impassive partner. Before describing their heartbreak and disappointment with a hyperbolic tone, pointing out that even though it is sad, their youthful naivete has caused them to overreact, and questioning what they expected would happen and why they took it so seriously in the first place. In the song's pre-chorus, the narrator predicts the dissolution of their relationship, hoping that his cynicism is wrong, but knowing from experience that he's right. and, in the song's chorus, elaborates on his prediction of their falling apart. Causing him to reflect on his own life, and how the dreams of childhood give way to the pain and suffering of adulthood. In 
In the second verse, the song's narrator once again describes their heartbreak and disappointment with hyperbole, the simple breakup becoming as tragic as the album's title track, as their relationship born from youthful naivete fizzles out and they become more cynical. once again causing the song's cynical narrator to sympathize with them. Like Teenage Wildlife, the song is a warning to the next generation, but unlike Teenage Wildlife's warnings about fame and authenticity, Because You're Young is a more general, subdued warning about youthful naivete letting you down, and the cynicism that can come with age. This warning is echoed in the song's vocals, which alternate between some of the most subdued on the album, representing the narrator's cynicism and knowledge that, like most sadness life throws at you, they will soon get over it, and exaggerated, reflecting the hyperbolic language of the lyrics describing their heartbreak. So much so that Bowie's singing in the song's outro turns the common occurrence of a breakup when you're young and naive into heartbroken wailing. The song's instrumentals are also... interesting. O'Leary argues that the song's most fascinating parts melodically come at the very beginning, with Pete Townsend's stunning guitar opening accompanied by Andy Clark's chilling synthesizer. But as the song goes on, quote, it grows duller and the payoffs don't seem worth the effort, end quote. While I don't mean to hand wave away the parts of the song that seemingly fall flat because they were intentional, which I'm skeptical of to begin with, I do find it fascinating how O'Leary's description matches up with some of the song's themes of the naivete and hope that comes with being young, giving way to a more bitter, cynical outlook as life goes on. The song's exaggerated outro fades out, and the final song on the album begins. And it's no great. The album's final song is the second part of It's No Game. The lyrics are mostly the same as the first part, with a few exceptions. The Japanese half of the lyrics is missing. The first verse has an additional four lines of childlike gibberish, which I'm going to guess were written using Bowie's cut-up technique. Just walkie-talkie Heaven or heart Just big heads and drums Full speed and pagan the only thing I can glean from which is that big heads and drums might be referring to the egotistical music icon present in Teenage Wildlife and the video for fashion. And there's a third verse made up of entirely new lyrics describing yet another image of the grime and hardship plaguing the song's first part and much of the album, and possibly criticizing the new romantic movement for a final time. Children round the world Put camel shit on the walls they're making carpets and treadmills, or garbage sorting. Where the song really differs from its first part is in its much calmer vocal style, which is the polar opposite of the first part's chaotic, guttural screeching, more closely resembling the hopeless and depressing atmosphere of Tired of My Life, and the fatalistic, indifferent atmosphere of Up the Hill Backwards, but without Fripp's high-energy searing guitar solos to refute it. The instrumentals in It's No Game, Part 2, are just as subdued as the song's vocals, with O'Leary pointing out that the song, quote, with its precise guitars, Carlos Alomar playing three miniature riffs at various points in the verses, and steady rhythms, seems like a sanctioned protest, a nostalgic fit of controlled anger, end quote. Bowie had quite a lot to say about this decision to create the two parts of It's No Game in totally polarized styles. And while the following two clips I'm about to play are a bit long, I think they're vital to understanding the track. I think the reasoning behind that stemmed from wanting to not come out with one blatant sort of protesty song, but show that feelings of uh, anxiousness about society are expressed on different levels and with different intensities. And the, the course of the album takes you through a lot of the doubting and the, uh, 
um, dilemmas that I myself as a writer find myself in. And so you open with one kind of protest which gradually and insidiously becomes something less traumatic by the end, end of the album. Bowie continued this explanation on the second side of the interview promo disc, going on to say, what happens when, when a protest or an angry statement is, is thrown against the wall so many times that the, the, the speaker finds that he has absolutely no more energy to give it any impact anymore? And so it comes over in that very sort of lilting, very melodic kind of superficial level. The, the sentiment is exactly the same as in the, the first one on the first sign, but the... Uh, the ambience has changed. It's a gentle, sort of, almost nostalgic kind of thing, quality to it, rather than the very angry, vehement statement on the beginning of the album. In the first part, the narrator is disgusted and enraged with the injustices in the world. But over the course of the album, which sees vehement and bleak statement after vehement and bleak statement thrown against the wall, he is still displeased with the injustices in the world and anxious about where society is heading. But his anger has been spent, reducing his protests to the brink of apathy. It's this melancholic hopelessness that we're left to meditate on, until the sound of the tape in Visconti's tape deck spooling out plays, and we're once again disorientingly made aware of the fact that we're listening to a piece of music before the album ends. Bowie once described scary monsters as a purge, an attempt to eradicate the feelings within himself that he was uncomfortable with, and listening to it makes this clear. The album is a dark, meta-examination of his legacy and a killing off of his past on a scale that we wouldn't see until he created Blackstar nearly three and a half decades later. It exists between the moody, experimental work of his Berlin trilogy and his more commercially successful pop music of the 1980s, as a Pandora's box filled to the brim with bleak visions of corruption, decay, and endless suffering, but without a grain of hope to combat it. The victim of the title track's narrator is left permanently damaged. Major Tom never overcomes his addiction. The goon squads of fashion are left chasing trendy style after trendy style. The protagonist of Teenage Wildlife is left a mangled corpse on the ground, his mourners totally apathetic about his demise. The violently oppressed gay people of Scream Like a Baby never find liberation. The hope for salvation of Verlaine's Kingdom Come is reduced to little more than a dark joke. The relationship in Because You're Young fizzles out, and with it the youthful naivete of its protagonists, as they desperately cling to the broken pieces of romance. And the disgust, outrage, and societal anxiety of the narrator in the first part of It's No Game, also present in Up the Hill Backwards, is replaced with the melancholic hopelessness of the album's conclusion. It's this bleak meditation on hopelessness, combined with the examination of his legacy and the killing off of the past, that, while not entirely pleasant, keeps us coming back to the album, time and time again. Hi there, I hope you enjoyed my analysis of Scary Monsters. If you did, feel free to like the video, subscribe to my channel, and share your thoughts on the album in the comments below. As always, links to my script and my sources are available in the description below, and the art I produced for it is up on my Pinterest. Bye! Why the hell do I do this to myself?